What we'll do today is we will introduce the concept of spin. It is given to you first at school, then in your various chemistry courses, but it is never properly explained. You are giving a hand-waved explanation saying, well, imagine a spinning charge, except there is no charge and it's not actually spinning. Uh, and you are given a bit of mathematics that is not actually derived. So today we will properly derive spin and we will have to start from quite a bit of history to give you the context of why it is so closely related to angular momentum and why a lot of derivations that we do are by analogy with angular momentum. So going back to 1925, uh, Uhlenbeck and Houtsmith uh, in the Netherlands were staring at the pretty standard at the time um, photographic plate containing the spectrum of the hydrogen atom. Uh, and that's the famous blue-violet uh, Balmer line of it. And if you look very closely at it, then this is the relation that connects the positions of this line to a couple of integers. And that's the famous Rydberg formula that you must have seen if you've dealt with the hydrogen atom. Right, so we have the principal quantum numbers of the upper level and the lower level, uh, the Rydberg's constant, and then the frequency or equivalently the reciprocal wavelengths of our light is connected to the energy level separation as it should be. And it just follows from non-relativistic Schrodinger's equation and you've done the hydrogen atom in your courses previously, so you know where this comes from. What is strange, however, is if you zoom into this, if you look at the so-called alpha line of, in this case, hydrogen and in this case, deuterium, because of the isotope effects, they are shifted ever so slightly, you can see the extra splitting. Tiny, but clear, which is not predicted by Rydberg's formula here. And uh, if you look at the wavelengths, you can, of course, find out the energy of that splitting. And this is something that doesn't follow from Schrodinger's equation. But it wasn't until around 1920s that this was recognized because, of course, you need very high resolution spectrometers to see that. Okay, so Q, uh, two PhD students at the time, uh, Ullenbeck and Howard Smith, who were given the task uh, by their supervisor at the time, um, Ehrenfest, to find out what is going on here. And recent circumstances in the recent history, of course, Rutherford Bohr model of the atom appeared in 1913, then theory of relativity, first special and then general, around the same time and about 1925, there was ongoing effort on relativistic effects in astronomy. And if you read uh, Houtsmith's um, many writings on the subject, uh, autobiographical writings, uh, he says quite openly that the two of them have been completely clueless about what it is that's expected of them and how to fix this extra splitting that they hadn't uh, the foggiest idea uh, where it could possibly come from. So what would PhD students do? They would hit the library and start looking around the possible physical effects that might explain the thing. And of course, um, in astronomy, relativity was all the rage and they looked at astronomical bodies and realized that, of course, beyond the orbital angular momentum, which is well understood in both classical and quantum mechanics, astronomical bodies can also rotate around themselves, so they can have an intrinsic angular momentum. And if you write down the standard equations of motion uh, there for the momentum of a gravitating system, uh, then you've got the standard gravitational field, you've got the external force, and that's your linear momentum. And this is your spin, which precesses around um, a direction that is prescribed by the classical mechanics. So astronomical bodies have simply just a classical quantity uh, called spin. And if you look further into what it is processing around, there's a bunch of relativistic effects in there. From special relativity, you have the so-called Thomas precession, and that was discovered in 1927. And if you look at the top um, 
tip of the spinning top, the classical spinning top just rotates around the circle, and if you start introducing special relativity, it begins to wobble. So this is called Thomas precession. There's then the Turing effect. If you have a body that's orbiting, for example, a rotating planet, uh, then relativistic frame dragging means that the trajectories do not quite connect if you are orbiting a spinning body. So that's the Newtonian gravitation, that is the special relativity. Uh, and uh, this again was known, einstein turing lenze effect. And uh, if you are really, really into fine details of that, there's even a spin-spin coupling in astronomy, but it's only non-negligible of fairly extreme gravitational events. Uh, but all of that is, of course, not quantum mechanics. This is classical physics and special relativity. Uh, but um, Ullenbeck and Goodsmith were sitting there and thinking, well, can we steal some of this stuff from the astronomers to try and explain the extra splitting that we have in quantum mechanics? So that is what they did. So they said, well, okay, let's take our Hamiltonian, you know, the usual momentum squared over 2m, the usual potential, you've seen it for the hydrogen atom, and just add the extra coupling that we've stolen from the astronomers. Maybe the electron has some kind of intrinsic angular momentum, which is coupled to orbital angular momentum, and then, of course, the lines will additionally split. Uh, and so what they proposed is, okay, you've got this 3s to 2p emission, and if you introduce that, then you'll have the extra splitting. The requirements for that extra splitting, however, have been quite surprising. It did explain what they had observed, but uh, there were immediately massive objections to an attempt to do that. As then understood, a quantum mechanical operator couldn't possibly have exactly two eigenvalues. If you look at a continuous integral differential or multiplicative operator in mathematics, it can have infinitely many eigenvalues or it can have none. If the problem is insoluble, there's no way for a differential operator to have exactly two eigenfunctions and no more. Lorentz estimated the surface velocity of what would have happened if the electron were truly spinning and realized that the surface velocity would have to be the 10 times the speed of light, uh, and that was a pretty serious objection. Then, of course, there are exactly two. And remember our orbital quantum numbers. We have um, L equals 0 for the S orbital. We have L equals 1 for the P orbital. And there are three P orbitals. So you can have zero, you can have three, you can have five for the d orbitals, but you can never have two. And so this cannot actually be a, a true angular momentum. Then if you follow the rabbit hole in mathematics, you get bizarre interpretations like you need to rotate the system by four pi instead of two pi for it to return to the original place. Um, anyway, so these were of course incompatible with the physics as then understood, and even now. And so this spin cannot possibly be the classical angular momentum. And Heisenberg wrote a right, nice letter to, to Houtsmith, uh, in which he called that proposition, uh, which they published in 26, Seine mutige Note, uh, your brave uh, note. And of course, the two Muppets also managed to lose a factor of two in their calculations in the published paper. And so Pauli has politely asked, was haben Sie mit dem Faktor 2 gemacht? And uh, so both uh, openly admitted at the time that they didn't understand one bit of it. However, what it did, of course, was to explain all of it and a lot of other spectroscopy nearly instantaneously. Uh, what followed uh, can be described as the great confusion. So the physicists at the time were quite surprised that something so inexplicable should suddenly explain so much. And this is a letter from Llewellyn Thomas, a Scottish physicist, to Sam, to Sam Houtsmith. Uh, and uh, he writes literally, I think you and Ullenberg have been very lucky to get your spinning electron published and talked about before Pauli heard of it. It appears that more than a year ago, Kronig, uh, a, a German physicist, believed in the spinning electron and worked out something. The first person he showed it to was Pauli. Pauli ridiculed the whole thing so much that the first person became also the last and no one else heard anything of it. Which all goes to show that the infallibility of the deity, meaning Pauli, uh, does not extend to his self-styled vicar on Earth. So this was all moderately shocking at the time. Lawrence, 
uh, that is very difficult because it causes the self-energy of the electron to be wrong. Aaron Fest, well, that's a nice idea, though it may be wrong, but you don't yet have a reputation, so you have nothing to lose. Bohr, on your way home, you should stop off at Hamburg and explain the factor too to Pauli. Pauli, eine neue Copenhagener Irrlehre, the new Copenhagen heresy. Uh, the old Copenhagen heresy, of course, being the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. So, um, well, uh, Lavelle and Thomas eventually found the factor of two, but of course everyone was intensely uncomfortable with what the hell was going on at the time. So what we will now do is, of course, uh, untangle all the mess. Now we do know where spin comes from and we do know where exactly it is. And I have to teach you a little bit of special relativity for us to really understand what is going on. So the first glimpse of what was going on was given by Paul Dirac, who reverse engineered the relativistic energy equation. And uh, E equals mc squared is nonsense from the BBC. It is not actually true. You have an extra term in there corresponding to momentum. Of course, you would have, right? If the body moves, the energy increases. So the real relativistic energy relation is, is this. So E squared m squared c to the fourth plus c squared momentum squared. And in the same sense as we did it for the hydrogen atom in in your non-relativistic quantum mechanics, we say, well, okay, let's hope we can find an operator by just replacing every quantity here with the corresponding operator, and we just have the momentum operator here, and hope for the best. And that would, of course, then hopefully be the Hamiltonian squared, and this is what Dirac had tried to do. He quickly realized that he cannot actually take the square root of this because if he tries writing some trial Hamiltonian as mc squared and then the three momentum operators px, py, pz, then there is no, no numbers alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3 such that this would square into an expression that is consistent with this. Dirac knew a lot of mathematics. He realized that, well, okay, if these are not numbers, maybe they could be matrices. And then he did manage to find a set of matrices that satisfy this. Uh, but of course, this was a lucky guess by Dirac's uh, own admission. And spin operators did turn up and everything got explained. But once again, nobody really understood why or what is the physical mechanism of that. Uh, so this dubious hack, uh, Dirac's quote, uh, became known as Dirac's coup, but it wasn't until Eugene Wigner uh, in, um, I think, 1929, uh, 31, that a detailed explanation was given. And so what we will now do is we will follow Wigner. We will start with basic symmetries. Uh, we will go into group theory, which you are familiar with by now from crystallography and Huckel theory. Uh, we will use group invariants that we'll see there to find the equations of motion and eventually we will derive spin. Okay, so starting from the very, very beginning, we need to make ourselves quantum mechanics. So we assume that reality is knowable, which is not an unreasonable thing to assume. So for any finite and isolated physical system, there must be a way of describing it, therefore. So there must exist some kind of descriptor which needn't be the wave function, simply just a way of describing your physical system. We will also assume that reality has rules. We don't know what they are, but it is reasonable to assume that some rules exist. And so if the system had a particular state at time t, then there should be some operator that applies the rules and takes it to some time t plus t prime. So causal determinism, philosophically. And let's think about what these rules might be and what this operator could be. Well, firstly, we assume that time is uniform. That is, if you report or perform the same thing tomorrow as you did yesterday, you will likely get the same answer. And so these rules cannot depend on absolute time. They can only depend on the increment between now and some future moment, right? So the rules are overall time invariant. Uh, what is also important is, of course, there is the unit operator here that does nothing when tau is zero. If you take two steps, they are the same as just one longer step. 
and so we have the unit operator we have the closure and information cannot be lost so this must also have the inverse and so these rules they satisfy the property of a group remember in crystallography right you have the unit operation you have the reverse for every operation and the superposition of two operations is the operation of the same kind so this also applies to these rules so it turns out uh, this is a group and it's called the time propagation group Okay, what can we look? Uh, well, can we look at it a little bit further? We can, of course, assume, again, that reality is continuous. It sure does look continuous. There are no discrete jumps in time. So that means we can do a Taylor series. So Psi T plus T uh, plus Tau. Taylor expansion uh, around T. So this is, again, something you've seen in your lecture courses. Uh, and then, of course, if you look at this really carefully, this is also the Taylor expansion of an exponential function. And so we arrive at this strange operator, the exponential of d by dt, that appears to push our system forward in time. And that is a fairly common expression in physics. The exponential of a derivative is a finite shift. So if we take d by dt, exponentiate and put a tau, it shifts us forward by tau. Okay, and this is something that uh, you may or may not have been taught by the chemists by now. In Huckel theory, you must have heard about irreducible representations. So much like every geometric group has irreducible representations, continuous group of time translations also has irreducible representations. Uh, and the corresponding eigenfunctions are, of course, exponentials because the exponential doesn't change when you differentiate it. Only some number comes out in front and that is the eigen, eigenvalue. Okay, but any representation of a group is a direct sum of irreducible representations and so we arrive at the fact that the action by a derivative is equivalent to multiplication by a number and there may be several such numbers in which case in group theory they are concatenated into a matrix which gives us this lovely expression uh, that d by dt is representable by some matrix multiplication. And of course, this is just Schrodinger's equation with psi missing here and here. And so, well, uh, it turns out that in any knowable and continuous reality with unchanging rules, the only equation of motion you can possibly have is a Schrodinger type equation of motion. And so that's a derivation for Schrodinger's equation, and this is why it exists. It comes about because of fundamental properties of time. Okay, what about space? Uh, of course, we just had d by dt, which was pushing us forward in time. Uh, you will not be surprised to recognize the momentum operators. They are pushing us forward in space. Uh, and in order to match the units, of course, here we have units of meters, meters, meters. Uh, to match the units on time translation, we need to multiply it by some number with dimension of velocity. So velocity times time is again coordinate. So we have four operators, three for space and one for time, that are pushing us in the corresponding coordinate directions. And so these are now translations in space as well as time. Okay, and likewise, the arbitrary translation operator is going to be the exponential of some combination of this. Let's take a look a bit closer at what all of these things mean. Well, if we look at the so-called Casimir operator of the group, I don't think you have come across it in your finite groups in crystallography, but um, in quantum mechanics, it's essentially the sum of squares of that and that and that and that. And that quantity is always conserved. And if we look at what is being conserved, well, this is clearly the total linear momentum squared. Uh, we've seen in the previous slide that this is the energy squared. And then this must be something that relates linear momentum to energy. And that, of course, has to be mass because that is the proportionality between linear momentum and energy. So it turns out that mass has to be conserved as the result of reality being uniform. Okay, if we put the mass to zero, then it turns out we get this equation here, put the derivatives back, obtain that. This is a well-known equation, has been known since Huygens. Um, uh, this is the wave equation. And of course, 
the coefficient in front was known at the time for classical mechanics to be propagation velocity for waves. Well, what's the velocity of propagation of massless waves through empty space? That's, of course, the speed of light. And so, once again, a bunch of fundamental symmetries tell us that mass must exist and the speed of light must exist as the maximum velocity that a massless object can have. Okay, so we've discovered the speed of light, we've discovered mass, uh, this relativistic energy-momentum relation then tells us that energy actually now has a definition, it's linear momentum in time. Uh, and uh, this is what we can get from translational symmetry of physical reality. Let's take a look at rotational symmetry now. And this is something you are all familiar with. You've done your point groups. So two rotations in sequence are another rotation. There is a unit rotation that does nothing. Every rotation has an inverse rotation. And in geometric group theory, this was called O, o I think. Uh, the group of all rotations, and then you remember OH, TH, uh, D6H, they are all discrete geometric subgroups of the full rotation group. And let's take a look at what rotations tell us now. Okay, well, in the same way as the derivative with respect to time was pushing us forward in time, derivative with respect to coordinate was pushing us forward in coordinate, derivative with respect to the angles and rotates us around. And so if we act with an exponential of that on some function of the angle, we will increment that angle. And of course, what we also need is the axis around which we are rotating. Okay, if we do a little bit of trigonometric transformations on d by d phi, we realize that d by d phi is this x d by dy minus y d by dx, where you will recognize the angular momentum operators from your angular momentum theory. So in the same way as linear momentum were translation generators, angular momentum operators are rotation generators. This is where they're coming from. And you all remember these lovely commutation relations from angular momentum theory. We will have something similar in spin as well. But what is important here is yet another Casimir operator turns up that corresponds to a conserved quantity. So if we scroll all the way here, you all remember the total momentum operator, which is that squared and that squared and that squared, and that total momentum is conserved. And in group theoretical language, these commutators are called structure relations. The space where these operators live is called an algebra. They themselves are called generators. This exponential that we've seen a few times is called the exponential map. And the result is a rotation. So any rotation can be written in this form. But this is not interesting to us. Uh, so this is just for completeness sake. What we are interested in is, again, as the consequence of rotational symmetry of physical reality, there exists a conserved quantity corresponding to the orbital angular momentum. Uh, and this operator, as you know, commutes with Lx, Ly, and Lz. It enumerates the rotational group irreps, so all of these spectroscopic term symbols, um, remember the, the term symbol like sigma or pi and so on, then the j and 2s plus 1. So the term symbols in atomic spectroscopy are in fact irreducible representations of this uh, rotation group and, well, conserved quantity. So orbital angular momentum, as we can see from here, is conserved because reality is isotropic. Okay, but throughout so far, right, we've dug through the math, we discovered the invariant mass, we discovered linear momentum, we discovered angular momentum, we discovered energy, we discovered speed of light. Where's the spin? And in order to find spin, we need to do uh, a little uh, further piece of history. Quite a long way before quantum mechanics even, uh, Michelson and Morley did an experiment in which they intended to measure um, the speed of light as a function of direction. They were expecting the Earth to be moving through some kind of interstellar medium, luminiferous ether they called it, uh, and they expected 
sound waves and light waves to be in some sense similar. So much like sound is the compression of the air, they hoped uh, at that time that light would be the compression of some luminiferous medium. So they expected it to be a longitudinal wave of the same kind of sound wave. And then, of course, the usual effect of the approaching train must also work for light. And so the speed of light would be different in the direction uh, of the Earth's travel uh, through whatever intergalactic interstellar medium and opposite to that direction. And so they were hoping to measure that. To their surprise, after constructing a really sophisticated interferometer for 1887, that was state of the art, they realized after repeated measurements that the speed of light had been stubbornly identically the same in every direction. So the idea of light being a longitudinal wave of the same kind of acoustic waves flew out of the window. They had a chant with Lorentz, uh, a mathematician, who suggested uh, preposterously at the time, I mean, this is 1887, that the only way that this invariance of the speed of light could be reconciled with the physics of the time and Maxwell's equations, incidentally, that were by then already known, is if they assume that any object that moves is slightly shrunk in the direction of travel and its local time is slightly slowed down, right? So Lorentz transformations. And so he said, okay, we've got the time, we've got the coordinate, and there has to be a transformation that delays time and shrinks the coordinate. And that became known as the Lorentz transform. This is the only transformation that fits the bill. I will not derive it because we will never use it uh, after today. But this is the transformation Lorentz suggested that makes space talk to time. Uh, and they were also quite shocked by the proposition. If you read the paper, uh, it's very carefully worded. Uh, it's not like, oh, the theory of electrical and optical phenomena. No, Versuch. I'm a theory, the electrician and optician and so on, uh, an attempt at the theory. So they weren't terribly confident about what they were doing, but that was an early indication that meta had wave-like properties. Okay, so let us now explore the consequences of this and try and find another conservation law that will eventually give us spin at this point. So we take Lorentz transformation and we do a little bit of trigonometry. Uh, we replace that with a tan tangent, hyperbolic tangent, in this case of a certain angle, in which case the transformation becomes trigonometric, in which case, again, it is an exponential of a certain operator, this uh, strange angle, you know, the stretch and squeeze uh, of space-time became known as rapidity. And after you do enough trigonometry on that, you realize that there are three more operators that look terribly like the angular momentum operators from the previous slide with two significant differences. Firstly, it's not x and y, it's x and time. Secondly, there's a plus here. And in angular momentum operators, we had a minus. So angular momentum operators were trigonometric. They were rotating things around. These operators are hyperbolic. They are stretch and squeeze. They squeeze space and they stretch time. But much the same way as we did it for angular momentum, we can calculate their commutation relations and see what's in there and therefore look at what's conserved. And it turns out if you do the commutation relations, well, this is our good old angular momentum. So Lx commute Ly is Ilz. But if you do the commutation of these boost operators, then it turns out that they don't commute between themselves. The commutator between Kx and Ky is not Kz, it's Lz. And that's a bit shocking because it turns out Therefore, that there are more ways of rotating things in relativistic space-time than there had been in three dimensions. So this strange four-dimensional object, Minkowski space-time it's called, extra ways appear in which things can be rotated compared to the Euclidean 3D. In particular, what this tells us, 
that if you boost an object in one direction and then you boost it in a perpendicular direction, then the result will be, will have a component of rotation of the object itself. And this is a fundamental difference. Previously, in classical physics, in three dimensions, we could not rotate a point object because point object has an infinite moment of inertia. So it couldn't be rotated. In special relativity, we now can. If we take a point object, we boost it in x and we boost it in y, turns out we have rotated the object ever so slightly. And so the conservation law is now modified. We no longer just have the squared angular momentum, so Lx squared, Ly squared, Lz squared, which is what is normally conserved. We also have this squared boost. And so what is now conserved is not just angular momentum, but angular momentum plus something else. And that something else is called spin. So this is um, a whistle-stop tour, right? As you can imagine from all the mathematics I have skipped and glossed over, that that's about 30 pages of pretty sophisticated group theory as to where uh, all of that mass actually comes from. Obviously, I will not examine uh, any of this, uh, but this is, um, I'd say, necessary because otherwise chemists are terribly confused about what spin is. So spin is a relativistic correction to the conserved quantity of angular momentum all right, that comes about because you can rotate things in a few extra ways in four dimensions compared to what you had been able to do in three. Okay, so that is our spin. Let us now take a look at the nucleus. Once again, you have never looked inside the nucleus. You were told, okay, it's a particle, it has a charge, but it doesn't just have the charge, it has an awful lot of internal structure. And to understand where nuclear spin comes from, we need to take a look at that structure. Uh, that's, for example, the charge density as a function of nuclear radial coordinate. Nuclei are a few femtometers across, a femtometer is 10 to the minus 15th meter. And you can see the charge density is actually not uniform and nuclei have a diffuse surface. They are not hard balls of charge. Nuclei are not spherical. You can have an egg-shaped nucleus, you can have a mango-shaped nucleus. In a certain excited state, you can have a heart-shaped nucleus. So there is nuclear dynamics. You can take a nucleus and spin it up and down by colliding things with it. That's a famous example of Ferb Erbium 128 that's well studied. In collision experiments, you can take the ground state nucleus and spin it up to extremely high quantum numbers. Uh, as you spin it further and further and further up, um, a few nucleons detach themselves and begin orbiting the nucleus in the way that the authors of this paper compare to rings on Saturn. Uh, eventually, the nuclear shape is distorted, and if you start spinning it even harder, the nucleus flies apart. So there's plenty of structure in these particle collision experiments, but even for nuclear ground states, um, samarium has this weird shape there's tungsten, that's lead. You know, an egg-shaped nucleus is not uncommon. So let us remind ourselves, uh, before we go further into nuclear structure, how we dealt with hydrogen. So this is just a flashback to how hydrogen atom had been derived for you. We had kinetic energy terms in the Hamiltonian, we had the Coulomb potential, we solved this equation, and we obtained our orbitals. S, P, D, F, all the quantum numbers, and so on. So we do the center of mass transformation, we get the reduced mass and the Laplacian here. That's the Coulomb interaction. After a lot of mathematics, we had split our wave functions into radial parts responsible for principal quantum numbers and angular parts, which are all our SPDF and so on orbitals. That was the horrible operator uh, that went into here that I don't think anybody ever really solved for you. But at the end of the day and after the dust had settled, we had the radial equation that gives us energy level numbering, so periods of the periodic table. And then we have the angular equation that gives us the orbital and the magnetic quantum numbers, and those are the SPDF orbitals and so on. And that leads to standard orbital classification. 
So this is something you may must have at least seen. What about the nucleus? We have a radically different force at play. This is no longer Coulomb interaction. This is strong nuclear force. Active at the distances of about a femtometer, about a hundred times stronger than electromagnetic interactions. So forget about Coulomb interactions. This is way stronger. It has the same relationship um, to the strong force between quarks as van der Waals interaction has to Coulomb interactions, a perturbative residuum. You could say that nucleons are slightly sticky because of this strong nuclear force. Nobody knows what the potential is even now, but mathematically it must exist. And because nuclei are not terribly far from spheres, the early researchers have assumed that this potential is center symmetric. So they said, let's do it just like we did it for the hydrogen atom. Our total energy is kinetic plus potential. Kinetic is p squared over 2m. This is some kind of nuclear retention potential. We don't know what it is, but let's try and solve some single nucleon Schrodinger's equation in this potential, which we will somehow fudge until the results match the experiment. Same radial angular separation, so the radial part is of course different because we don't know what the potential is, but the angular part is exactly the same. And so whatever nuclear orbitals are that protons and neutrons are kicking about in, we will actually have exactly the same SPDF and so on classification there. Okay, that's nice because this is something we are familiar with. So the strategy was for quite some years to just postulate this potential, solve the equations and look for match to the experiment. And it turned out that there are nuclei with particular stability that have particular numbers of protons and neutrons, the so-called magic numbers. That's the equivalent of inert gases uh, for the periodic table. Certain elements are quite stable in their electronic structure series, so neon, helium, and so on. Certain nuclei are particularly stable in their nuclear structure series. So we take some potential that looks just like vaguely um, uh, just um, a, a well, uh, different for neutrons and protons, of course, because protons are charged and they repel each other. And we solve a single particle Schrodinger equation in exactly the same way as we solved the hydrogen atom mathematically, except we are dealing with protons and neutrons now uh, rather than with electrons. We get energy level structure. Uh, in this wood saxon potential, you get energy levels and they you can see look superficially similar to hydrogen atom, but of course it's not. We are inside the nucleus now. Physicists have messed it up. They are not numbering it like we are numbering the hydrogen atom. They are numbering them in the order of appearance. So the first d orbital is called 1d uh, and the first f orbital is called 1f, which is a bit silly, uh, but this is how it is. You can have h orbitals and i orbitals inside the nucleus, so much higher um, magnetic um, orbital quantum numbers. Uh, so they are actually quite uh, accessible. And of course, all of these energy gaps are no longer kilojoules, they are mega electron volts. So these are some serious energies, so giga and terajoules. So we are, of course, always in the ground state in chemistry. And you can solve, uh, you know, and get the shapes. So that is the nuclear s orbital, this one. That's the nuclear p orbital. Uh, that's the nuclear d orbital. And these are femtometers now, rather than angstroms. It's so actually a lot of similarity between nuclear structure and electronic structure theory. And then, of course, spin orbit coupling. Remember, we had it for the electron. This is what was responsible for our term splittings in atomic spectroscopy. So again, another flashback to remind you about electron spin orbit coupling, uh, all the usual mass that you're hopefully familiar with. But because uh, the electron is negatively charged, this minus cancels and we have a positive spin orbit coupling. So things couple for the smallest total angular momentum. Uh, various commutation relations. This is where the term symbols are coming from. So spin, orbital and total momentum in there. And I will not go through all of this nitty gritty because you have seen it 
in all of your spectroscopy courses. Malcolm Levitt must have bored you stiff uh, with all of this theory at some point. And of course, these are all the usual orbital splittings from electronic structure theory that um, but importantly, parallel L and S orientations inside hydrogen are higher because this is positive. In, so this entire classification is of course spherical symmetry and spin. So let us go back to the nucleus and take a look at the spin orbit coupling inside the nucleus. Uh, a few major differences. Firstly, Coulomb interaction is like really weak. Uh, spin orbit coupling inside the nucleus is stronger than electrostatics. So we are always in the JJ limit of spin orbit coupling. Further, because we don't have negatively charged particles in there, the spin orbit coupling because of this minus is negative. So nuclei are coupled for the parallel orientation of spin and orbit. So they are lower in energy. And then all of the usual mathematics, that's exactly the same as the hydrogen atom. And it turns out, once you put all of these numbers in, that we do reproduce the magic nucleon numbers for the stable nuclei. The final thing to note, of course, in the hydrogen atom, you only had electrons. And you had Fermi exclusion principle, two electrons cannot sit in the same orbital in the same spin and so on. We now have two types of particles. We have protons and neutrons. And so we have two Pauli exclusion principles separately for protons and neutrons. And because protons and neutrons are different, they can actually sit in the same place at the same time. Okay, so let's take a look at how nuclei are made up and where nuclear spin actually comes from. Carbon-13, proton sublevels, one S half, two antiparallel protons, one P3 half, four antiparallel protons sitting in those orbitals, the neutron orbitals, one S half, two neutrons, one P3 half, four neutrons, and there is an unpaired neutron kicking about in the 1p half orbital. You can see the total angular momentum of this nucleus is 1 half. This is why carbon-13 has a spin half. Nitrogen-15, protons, 1 is half 2, 2p3 half 4, 1p1 half. You can see superficially similar to hydrogen-like population numbers, except spin orbit coupling is explicit here already. So we have two paired up neutrons but one unpaired proton in nitrogen 15 and so we have total J half. Oxygen 17 is quite interesting. You have fully uh, coupled up proton shell and you have a single unpaired neutron kicking about in D5 half orbital. And of course D5 half is L equals 2 and S equals half. So even though this is called a spin, actually the, the property is mostly orbital. So it comes from L equals 2 of the nuclear d orbital. So actually nuclear spin, as you can now see, isn't really spin. It's the total angular momentum of the nuclear ground state. Electron spin is spin in the strict relativistic sense that I've described, but the nuclear spin is a very effective quantity that comes out from the entire complexity of the nuclear structure and is actually the total angular momentum of the nuclear ground state. And you can have actually orbital diagrams in here. So this is the proton sublevel system and that's the neutron sublevel system. And you can see proton energy levels are ever so slightly higher than the neutrons. That's because protons have Coulomb repulsion and so all of the energies will be slightly higher. So there's our oxygen 17 with this unpaired neutron sitting here in D5 halves. That's the nitrogen 14 with two unpaired nucleons, one proton and one neutron. They couple for maximum total momentum. This is why nitrogen 14 has a spin one. And oxygen 16, a fully closed, very stable nucleon shell uh, where all of the particles are paired up and therefore there is no spin. So this is where the nuclear spin is coming from. Okay, so summary. 
we've uh, had uh, probably the uh, we packed up the entire content of a giant nuclear structure module that uh, we would teach here in the physics department into one lecture. So this, this is a, a, a Hollywood movie style, so I will not examine any of this. I will only examine your magnetic resonance. Uh, but you need to know where all of that is coming from, right, at, at the very beginning. So nuclei have a structure, uh, nuclei have orbitals. Uh, the potential for the strong nuclear force that holds nucleons together is unknown. Uh, the potential for interquark interactions might not even exist. You need quantum field theory to describe it, but we can approximate and fudge things, as you can see. Spin orbit coupling inside the nucleus is in fact stronger than Coulomb interaction, which is why we need to take it into account explicitly in the orbital structure. Nuclear spin, as you saw, isn't actually spin in the same sense as electron. It's the total angular momentum of the nuclear ground state, which is why you can have things like negative magnetogyric ratios for nitrogen 15 and so on. We will cover that in due course. Chemists are, of course, always sitting in the ground state of every nucleus. The first excited state of the nucleus is, you know, several gigajoules away. There's only one nucleus, a strange isotope of americium, where the nuclear excited state is in the ultraviolet, so you can populate it. But normally, the nearest excited state will be somewhere in the X-rays, uh, even if it's a vibrational excited state. So nuclei can, of course, also vibrate. Uh, but a consequence of that is the magnetic moment becomes proportional to the total angular momentum, and this is why nuclei have magnetic moments. Uh, quadrupolar interaction also uh, appears. I will not uh, mention this in the course. Uh, and if you are interested in any further details on how nuclear shapes come about, that's radi uh, radium uh, 224, mango shaped famously, uh, then there's uh, a little bit of extra reading. Uh, and if you're really, 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 really hardcore and want to know the, the fine mathematical details of that, that's chapter three of, of my book uh, on the subject. And I think Pepe and Malcolm also uh, mentioned it in their books at some point, uh, although maybe in slightly less mathematical detail. 